Hello and welcome to the Northeast Grazing and Livestock Conference. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the National Grazing Lands Coalition, American Farmland Trust, Farm Credit East, Morrison Custom Feeds, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Please take a moment to visit their virtual booths for more information about their work. I'd also like to thank our partners, the Cedar Tree Foundation and the Forest C. and Francis H. Latner Foundation. They help make our work possible throughout the year. The entire New England Grazing Network would like to thank you for your participation in our first annual Northeast Grazing and Livestock Conference. Enjoy the conference. A review of uh, all of the grazing content um, in this region and an introduction to the co organizers of the Northeast Grazing and Livestock Conference. Uh, my name is Alex Golchensky, and I work at Wolfsneck Center for Agriculture and the Environment. I'm the facilitator of the New England Grazing Network and one of the many co organizers of this conference this year. So in this session, um, we're going to have a guided discussion with the other, some of the other co-organizers of the Northeast Grazing and Livestock, Livestock Conference. It's a great opportunity to learn about the uh, work of our organizations, as well as look ahead to programming coming up in Northeast. Before I turn it over to our panelists, I'm just going to share a little bit about the New England Grazing Network, the group that we're all in, and um, the one of the organizers of this conference. So the New England Grazing Network um, project was founded on the concept that the six New England states and New York, um, as well as the whole Northeast region, could be powerful change makers if we aligned around a shared vision and worked collaboratively across state lines. The network shares the vision and goal of gathering and growing regenerative grazing farms across our region to address the challenges of adapting to climate change that are unique to our climate and ecosystem. We as partners are, we represent a diverse group of organizations, including nonprofits, um, uh, universities, extension, et cetera, that offer education, technical assistance and events in our own state and now regionally like this conference. This combination of working locally and connecting regionally has helped us to bring recognition, resources and programs from local areas to multiple states. So um, the way that this session is going to go today is I'm going to have each of our panelists introduce themselves as well as the organization that they're representing, quickly talk a little bit about their core programming and what they have coming up ahead, and then we'll switch over to a more interactive discussion to talk about more of the programming and dig into the questions that you have. So please enter questions into the Q&A chat as we go. So first I will turn it over to Sarah Cogswell, the Livestock Institute. Go ahead, Sarah. Hello, uh, thank you, Alex, and thanks for organizing. Um, so my name is Sarah Cogswell. I'm the executive director of the Livestock Institute of Southern New England. We own and operate a small scale USDA inspected slaughterhouse in Westport, Massachusetts. Um, so beyond that, as a nonprofit, we also offer education to the broad community and livestock growers in terms of obviously slaughter and processing information, um, farm profitability and how it relates to such. Um, we also kind of operate um, with the community members, educating them about where they can buy local, um, why the importance of livestock in our communities is, and um, just the benefits of local meat procurement. Um, I kind of came to TLI by way of, uh, I am a small scale farmer myself. We have a very small certified organic operation. Um, we also do pastured pork and poultry. So I got to know Meatworks <laughs> by bringing my hogs there and we were so excited. It's a facility that the whole region has been waiting for. Um, in about, in the early 2000s, we lost, um, or I should say, uh, a small scale, sorry, my dog is right here. Hi. Um, a small scale uh, abattoir closed down. And so a lot of people, a lot of small producers were thrown into limbo, not knowing where to process. So the group that came together and 
eventually became TLI and opened up Meatworks um, were, were close friends of mine, were relatives, were, you know, people in the community. And so I did not think I'd be working for this group down the line, but it turned out that way. And I'm, I'm very excited to be a part now. Um, but like I was saying, I came to it as a producer. And just to know that there was um, such an amazing facility, USDA inspected, no less, that was was close by, you know, definitely under 20 minutes for me, but for everybody that we serve, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and even a little bit into Southern Vermont and New York, as you said, um, it's been a, a breath of fresh air for sure. Um, we're still working a little bit on fine tuning our facility, fine tuning our operations, uh, getting the profitability of the business down. But um, in our fifth year of operation this year, we're, we're really excited. And we'll talk a little bit more further on in this discussion about upcoming objectives and whatnot. So thanks again for everybody listening. <laughs> thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks for the introduction and history of the Livestock Institute. I'm going to turn it over now to Rachel Moody. All right, good afternoon. Um, so I'm that one person probably that she was pointing out for New York um, with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, my title is really the Livestock Educator for the Capital Ag and Hort, Capital Area Ag and Hort Program. And so um, I cover four counties <clears throat> outside of the Albany area. And um, so most people know what the extension system is each land grant college in each state has one Cornell is slightly different than all the other ones and each county kind of has their own uh, plus the county funding so um, my job with livestock and, and why I'm so excited to be with this group is being on the border of both Vermont and Massachusetts um, we we do programming let's educational programming and um, really what I consider matchmaking for people. Um, historically, Cooperative Extension was basically taking research from land grant universities and bringing it to the farmers. And, you know, most things now it's the internet that does that. So I see my role is more putting on programs and educational programs that are really pertinent to the area, um, specific needs, and really just doing them matchmaking for people like uh, beginner farmers or, um, you know, like, you know, where is the nearest slaughterhouse or, you know, things like that. So um, I guess, yeah, but I grew up in this area and also have a farm with my husband. It's our family farm. I'm the fifth generation. Uh, I came back to the farm, I should say. Um, and we have sheep and couple cattle, I wouldn't even call it a cattle operation, and um, a lot of poultry, and we do also hay and straw. So looking to learn from a lot of people. Thanks, Rachel. I'm gonna turn it now over to Emma. Emma, can you unmute? We have uh, one person on the phone. Um, hi, Alex. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Emma Grant. I am the president of the Granite State Grazers Organization. Uh, we're a small nonprofit um, located here in uh, New Hampshire, kind of based out of the Concord, New Hampshire area. Uh, we're focused on supporting producers that utilize a grass-based uh, management system. We provide support, uh, education uh, via programming that we we put on ourselves um, and resources for producers, both big and small, all from, you know, sort of homesteading up until uh, larger uh, production uh, based farms as well. Um, so we focus a lot of our programming around peer to peer interaction and events um, in order to give producers the opportunities learn from each other as well as other um, industry professionals that we partner with. We work a lot with NRCS and UNH Extension. Um, so we utilize them a lot for collaboration. Um, and um, But we really love to have our producers have the opportunity to learn from one another. Our pasture walks are one of our cornerstone programs that we run. Uh, we do many in the season. Uh, but they're very popular for uh, our community and um, they 
give everyone the opportunity to go visit farms of all different sizes, learn from producers, um, and they're very loosely themed and they encourage a lot of discussion, which is something that we're very passionate about. Um, I personally am a very small scale producer. I have a small farm, a very diversified farm here in New Boston, New Hampshire. Um, I was introduced to rotational grazing at one of my first jobs out of college and it kind of rocked my world and inspired me to get involved with uh, the Grant C. Grazer organization. And I also implement those things on my farm as well. Um, so we, like I said, just to reiterate, we really um, sort of love to foster conversation and foster community uh, with farmers that all sort of have a like-minded interest in um, rotational grazing and grass-based um, management systems. So that is our passion here at Grand State Grazer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. I'm going to turn it now over to Andrew May. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew May. I'm the Grazing and Livestock Program Coordinator uh, for Grazing Programming at UVM Extension. Um, we, we, uh, I am housed, rather, within the Center for Sustainable Agriculture at UVM Extension. Um, and the mission of the Center for Sustainable Agriculture is to advance uh, sustainable food and farming systems in Vermont and beyond. So we cultivate partnerships, uh, support innovative research and practices, and inform policy to benefit Vermont communities and the UVM campus. Um, specific to UVM Extension grazing and livestock program, I mean, um, we're a coordinated effort between several teams here at UVM Extension based throughout the state and our teams provide comprehensive education, outreach, technical assistance, and again, collaborative research specific for grazing and livestock farmers um, across, across the state. Um, over the past year, we have worked to uh, complete somewhat of a, a strategic realignment. Um, so our, our kind of working mission at the moment is, is to build upon our ability to provide greater technical assistance and generate uh, greater awareness for our, our services to Vermont farmers. So in other words, we want to work directly with producers to build relationships, provide knowledge and outreach and pr practice uh, sound environmental stewardship. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this group today. Okay, great, thank you. And then I guess the last is Megan Sheridan. Hello, thank you. Oh, I my dog is sleeping. So luckily, every time I say hello, he like starts barking. So we're good. We're clear. Um, I am the executive director of the Vermont Grass Farmers Association. And um, we, uh, our mission is uh, to, de it's dedicated to furthering the use of managed uh, livestock grazing to create healthier soils, cleaner water, and financially and personally sustainable farms. Uh, we do that through building farmer to farmer connections and that wisdom sharing, much like some of these other organizations, like getting out into pastures with um, sometimes with grazing professionals, but often just with farmers who are grazing and um, opening up their pastures for um, pasture walks with other farmers. Um, we also uh, do other educational programming. I mean, since the pandemic, we've done a number of things um, like virtually and we've hosted the conferences um, and uh, we are also looking at other programming related to supporting the research that Andrew and UVM do. We're working on a number of projects, which I think we're going to talk about in a minute. So I'll, I'll leave that at that. But um, yeah, I think really trying to foster the, the relationships and networks, um, which is why it's great also to work with the New England Grazing Network. So I got into this work. I've actually um, went to Cornell with, um, for livestock and um, have worked on a diversity of livestock farms. So I was out in Wyoming on a 40,000 acre ranch um, with 450 head. And I've worked in dairy. My graduate work is actually in um, dairy and cheese processing and small on-farm processing facilities. So um, kind of the gamut been on sheep farms. Actually, I've um, 
lived on some uh, other working farms. I actually also had my own herd of cattle where I raised veal calves on my dairy cows. So, um, and I love working for grass farmers because I love grass farmers. Um, and I love being out on the pasture and having the livestock be out on the pasture. I and mean, there's kind of nothing better than those seeing the animals out uh, on pasture. So uh, that's, that. there you go. Great, thanks Megan. Thanks everyone for introducing themselves. Um, I think my next question, some of, I guess, popcorn around, some of you kind of talked about what you have coming up in 2023, but if anyone has anything they're really excited about coming up in 2023, both at their own organizational level, but then also after that, I want to, I want to hear more about what we're excited about at the regional level. So I'll let you popcorn to answer that question. I could go because I can always go. So um, we've got a bunch of stuff coming up in 2023 that I'm super excited about. So um, uh, Alan Williams is coming in April uh, and he's going to actually be out on uh, early spring pastures, which is exciting. He's going to be in Burlington on in the Burlington area. Um, we are working on identifying the farm right now and the and the schedule, but I'll get it up as soon as we can. So he'll on the 26th of April and on the 27th he'll be in the Dartmouth area, which um super exciting and um and glad to have him here for that. Uh and then the September 7th through I'm sorry, September 5th through the 7th, we're actually hosting the National Grazing Lands uh tour, uh grass based tour. So people will be um visiting five different farms in Vermont. It's a bus tour. Um super special discount price for everybody who attended the conference. So um, the uh, the tickets have just gone on sale and I'll post all about that, but um, tickets are regularly $395 to get on the bus, um, hotel not included. It's it's three days. It's like a half day and then two full days of, of getting on a bus. And, um, but for conference goers from now until Valentine's Day, so you know what you can get for a Valentine's Day present. Um, it's three hundred and twenty-five dollars. So woo woo, and I have a, a discount code to give folks who want to register for that. Um, yeah, we'll be going to five farms, and there is a website where all the information is up, and I will post that. Um, and again, it's the National Grazing Lands Coalition, so it's going to be folks from all over the country um, coming and getting on the bus. Um, What's more fun than that? Driving on a bus, visiting grass farmers. It's going to be great. Um, and then we have some we have some other stuff, but um, I think that might come up as as we move around. So won't take up too much time. Thanks. Uh, I, I can jump. I can jump in here. Okay. So um, so Meatworks just right off the bat, I'll say the, the slaughterhouse is available to visit. So that's an interesting thing to say, but I am more than happy to do, you know, if you're a producer or if you're, um, you know, thinking of being a producer, you can always give me an email, give me a call if you happen to be in the Southern Massachusetts area, and we can definitely give you a tour of Meatworks. I think it's a fascinating facility, obviously. Um, and just knowing the ins and outs makes you just that much better producer in my opinion and so that's kind of a, a theme running through um, a lot of the work that we're doing right now um, in particular we're offering uh, massachusetts rhode island and connecticut farmers free baleage testing and soil testing so if you again shoot me an email give me a call and we can organize probably <laughs> I mean, the baleage testing is, is easy to do right now, obviously, because everything's wrapped up and nice and easy to get to. Um, soil testing, not so much. So <laughs> it's getting a little tough out there. Um, but I can definitely visit you in the spring for that as well. Um, and this is this is all part of the work that this network is doing together. Um, in particular, we work with Yukon Extension very closely. Um, they're helping us kind of um, interpret the results that we get back from Dairy One and helping you make the decisions going forward with your baleage. Um, and your your nutrient program overall for for cows on grass and or or hogs or lambs or whatever you guys are growing. Um, 
Uh, and also maybe you heard Travis Perry talk earlier today. Um, you know, Travis is working one-on-one -on -one with farmers that come through the slaughterhouse on, you know, what's the best way to cut the animals that you're raising and what's your end game? You know, are you doing wholesale? Are you doing retail? Um, thinking about that profitability and um, again, Ridge and Yukon, we're talking about Joe Eimenheiser, we're talking about um, the quality of your meat and so forth. So all of this kind of wraps in and what we're looking for is that baseline of your soil, your baleage, you know, what's going into the animals. And then ultimately Meatworks can kind of help you with the data um, of at the slaughter time. So it's kind of this interesting holistic view that this, this network has really brought together. Um, Another fun project that is really on top of my brain is um, I'm, I'm working with Meatworks in terms of a farm to school program, more like farm to beef, uh, sorry, beef to school. That's what you would call it. And this is exciting for us because we're a unique nonprofit in that obviously owning a processor, uh, a processing plant is like connecting, you know, uh, there's an input or an influx of, of livestock out there or a whole, really revenue stream for farms that we haven't really explored. And thinking about that in terms of feeding those, not only who need it, but also running, keeping the processing plant going and with a throughput that is necessary um, to keep it open for small farms. Small farms are definitely our bread and butter. That's why we're open. But literally to keep the lights on, we do have to have a robust wholesale and retail outlet. So thinking of that process and how we can be of a benefit to farms, a different revenue stream, um, education on kind of like elevating management practices to create that high quality beef, but also the end users. Um, schools are so much fun to work with, as you might imagine. Um, the food service directors are over the moon to kind of think about unique ways of putting um, local beef into their menu plans instead of, you know, commodity or just making those simple changes can, can make all the difference. We've had some really successful burger nights recently. And um, we're actually selling about 10,000 pounds to a local city and it's being distributed to 13 different schools. So a couple of highlights from 2022 that we're moving into 2023. And so again, if anybody's interested or if their school system's interested, we do deliver. So just putting that out there. Um, and also thinking about that, again, I always think of like the full circle, the holistic view of this uh, land. You know, that's always a big issue that I think all of us are constantly thinking about and working with land trust to kind of change that dynamic of, um, you know, livestock is the answer or unanswer to climate change. So let's, let's think about it that way and, and how all the positive aspects of raising livestock, especially on land that you may not own. So we have to be a little bit more dynamic with all the land value and how high it is around New England. Um, so TLI as a part of that is starting the conversations with our, our much smaller local land trusts um, and not necessarily matching farms, but just kind of seeing what's out there. Again, we're kind of still on that base level of like, who needs land, where's the land? And like, if you're gonna raise animals, where, where, where are they gonna go? So some real basic stuff, but super exciting. Are we popcornering? So I guess I'll go next. Um, <clears throat> In, on February 11th, I have a, a beef quality assurance program going on in Cambridge, New York. Um, it is open for uh, the Vermont clientele who wanna come over the border um, to get certified or recertified for BQA. Um, and if you have questions on that, you can just ask me what that is. Um, and then I'm putting together a program for uh, March. Uh, we got, with a small grant a few years ago, we got, some equipment to do a small lab for parasite, uh, basically to do parasites for small ruminants. So the farmers can come for a small fee, bring their, their bags of poop and um, set up the slides and look through the microscope and see what their parasite loads are, what parasites they might have and whether they need to, um, you know, if they actually need to use any type of a medication or, you know, dewormer or not. And uh, this is kind of a, a big thing for a lot of, and this is for anybody, backyard owners to, you know, commercial farmers, just because um, it is detrimental to the small ruminant population. And so that's hopefully coming um, March 4th, it will be in the Rensselaer County area. We're gonna start at a farm and do FAMACHA training and um, a five, 
point tests and just do some talks about parasites and then we'll move to the actual lab area to to teach the people how to actually set up a slide and what they're looking at so i'm really excited about this one <laughs> um and just to put in a plug for a few other people around new york state that are a little bit more grazing uh for the grazing um people uh faye benson who's with central new york is putting on a getting the most out of your pastures um and it's in four locations in central new york um, so if you happen to live in that area, you can reach out to him at 607-391-2660. Uh, and um, they have, most of the first classes have already started and it's more of like a, more of like a panel discussion kind of like this is, but um, I'm sure if you reach out to him and if you're interested in it, um, I know that there's, you could probably put it in google it with cooperative extension and it might come up too i just don't want to take all the time to go over the whole agenda um and the other thing is the gas travaganza i know troy bishop is usually a part of this one too and this also with um cooperative extension and a few other people and that's july 20th the evening of july 20th through the 22nd um and it's at suny morrisville so there's other things that will be popping up but uh those are just the the things that are coming up for this half of the year. I can jump in next. Um, so yeah, as 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 a uh, uh, a team member of um, a greater extension organization, uh, agricultural extension, um, we we have been speaking a lot with folks over the past year in order to kind of inform the direction of, of the next year and the next couple years really um and one thing that we've we've definitely recognized is, is that more sustained effort is needed on a farmer by farmer basis to to reach them and support their goal of securely creating or expanding their pasture operations um and as a, an extension organization a, a huge part of that is uh, our team of really highly skilled technical assistance professionals. Um, so a lot of my work over the past year and what will hopefully uh, continue with, uh, you know, uh, come to fruition in 2023 is um, an outcome of grant writing. So there has just been a tremendous amount of grant writing in order to hire more professionals um, in the space. Um, so th there's, you know, three or four, possibly five different opportunities that we're waiting to hear back from, um, all of which will will be geared towards um, the hiring of more grazing TA professionals. So um, we, we also hope in 2023 to, to create some more projects and programs that will result in new tools, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and awareness um, uh, to benefit um, not just our technical service providers, but statewide service providers in, in the grazing and livestock space. And, and hopefully um, through that, reduce some of the discrepancies in advice and education that are being provided to farmers from different organizations through more shared communication. So we, we are hoping to offer um, technical assistance professionals in the Northeast and in Vermont in particular with more mentorship opportunities and opportunities for professional development um, and just increase the capacity of, of those folks to continue to provide their services um, through more shared communication with the with the different partner organizations across the state and the region we're hoping that um, that will provide for more opportunities for sharing of best practices and, you know, kind of reduce some of that mixed messaging that that might be you know, provided uh, throughout the region. So we're really excited about that and, and hoping that some of the uh, the funds will come through to, to just, you know, allow that to happen quicker and more vigorously. Um, I can jump in here. Um, so for Granite State Grazers, um, this past year, we <clears throat> put on a um, new farmers mixer event this past fall, um, and we had a, a really great turnout and a really amazing um, response to it. And basically the response was, we hope you guys do this again. Um, so we're definitely hoping um, most likely this fall to put on another new farmers mixer. It really um, gives new farmers and 
you know, um, established producers the opportunity to get together with one another, as well as um, we had uh, a lot of different technical providers and um, um, professionals within the field there to share their information and their experience. Um, and so it was just a great night of a lot of networking and um, camaraderie within the uh, community. So we enjoyed putting that on and our community really liked it as well. So uh, just keep that on everyone's radar. Um, we will absolutely be putting on more pasture walks this season. Last year we did um, two a month and we hope to be doing that again this um raising season. Uh, and we try to spread those out throughout the state as best as we can so that um, everybody can um, go to ones that are closest to them and uh, get different viewpoints, um, whether it be from different areas or climates uh, within the state and different challenges that uh, those farmers may be facing. Uh, with those pasture walks, we're also hoping to um, bring in some experts that are a little bit more adjacent. So most of those are farm farmer led, uh, but we're hoping to bring in some professionals this year that may, you know, be within the conservation realm, uh, things like that to give a different perspective and lead a different type of conversation uh, uh, with our farmers and um, new and different opportunities for them to look at uh, whether they have an established grazing system or they're looking just to get started. Uh, we completed our uh, beginning farmers toolkit this past year and we're really hoping to uh, get that out and wide this season as well as make any updates and changes to it as we get feedback from our community. We took a very um, New England specific uh, stance and viewpoint on that while building out that toolkit. So we wanted to make sure that um, whether, I mean, and it has everything in it from watering systems, fencing systems, um, and just choosing farms, livestock, all that information that you might need to know or curious about when starting uh, a, an operation. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that the, the suggestions we were making and the resources we were providing were specific and relevant to our um, farmers here in the New England area, and that they're all, you know, easily adaptable and, and things like that. Um, we're hoping for a lot of more collaboration this, uh, this coming season with different um, other organizations, uh, New Hampshire beef producers and things like that. Uh, so all in all, we're we're excited for another great season um, of just working together and uh, giving farmers the opportunity to come together, learn from one another, and um, provide resources for them throughout the season. Thanks. Awesome. It's really great to hear everything that you're all doing locally. It's just super inspiring, and there's there's a lot of parallels kind of forming and 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 in um programming for next year. And so it's, it's really great. Um, I want to turn our focus a little bit more to talking about the New England Grazing Network, which everyone on the panel here is a part of. Um, and, you know, this network has, has really primarily been a, a lot of a, a knowledge sharing and capacity building network. This, this group, as well as others, meet monthly to talk about what's going on in our states and talk about build alignment with what we're doing. But you know, with events like this Northeast Grazing Conference and others, we, you know, we're, we, we are hopeful to continue to kind of increase that capacity in the future. So I'm curious about each of your, your um, takes on how participating in this network has changed your approach locally, if it has, um, has it changed your approach to regional work? And um, what do you see as the challenges, barriers, and opportunities to moving towards more regional programming? I realize that's like a five part question, but answer any or all of it. Um. <laughs> um, I guess I'll start um, for me. So with Cornell Cooperative Extension and Cornell University, there's not a lot of uh, 
collaborated or, or you know, um, grazing information that's all in one place. And we don't have a specialist just for grazing. Hell, we don't even have a specialist for really any type of livestock anymore. But um, we are uh trying without with the other we have something called a, a pwt or a program work team throughout the state with all the livestock educators that we get together and we talk about programming we talk about challenges and stuff and um we're putting together one that um is for specifically grazing so that we'll have that on a website and as for for a resource and so for me and especially being close to new england growing up near new england I've worked in Massachusetts. Um, so for me, this has been something that like, it's it's a no brainer. Um, people in the Albany area can get to Maine before they can even get to Buffalo. So um, it's just, you know, more resources and uh, just a different group of farmers and people who have been working on grazing systems and diving into that um, more so not going to say that uh, than other people in New York, because we have a lot of farmers and other people dedicated to it, but at, at some sort of an organized size at the scale. And um, for me, that's really exciting and hoping to share that across New York state um, and just a fun group of people to, to, to learn from and, and just to, you know, and for my own personal benefit as well, having um, a farm that we're just starting to kind of revamp and get going and look at some different ways of doing things from traditional uh, old dairy farming. So, um, and I know there were some other questions here, <laughs> but um, we're all about collaboration anyway. I like collaborating. I like learning new things. I like meeting new people and being able to share that information with my uh, with, with our producers and, um, and also matchmaking again, it's just all about that. Like, Hey, you need, you're looking for this type of animal or you're looking for this kind of thing. You know, there's, there are only, you know, state borders, but there's a lot of, uh, people that I work with that are right along Vermont and Massachusetts and Connecticut. So, um, it's, it's all, you know, one giant pool is the way I look at it. So. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I was thinking about pool and jumping into the pool, which I was like, jump in the lake or the ocean. Um, so uh, I, you know, again, it's the collaboration across um, the state lines because um, I think, you know, what are the opportunities with with grazing and pasture raised animals, and where are the markets at? And you know, New England, I think it's it takes New England to feed New England. So I'm really interested in doing more to um, connect my farmers with their next door neighbors. And I also think that we all work on really small budgets. And like like Andrew was saying, so much stuff is is grant based or grant funded in order to keep it, um, it you know, at a reasonable price and accessible to everybody. So um, the more we can share our programming and resources, like I can't wait to get a bus to come see Sarah at the Livestock Institute and go to Meat Works. Like, yeah, of course we should do that. You know, it's just fun to be connected with like-minded folks and building programs. I mean, this being able to do a collaborative conference instead of each of us trying to pull off small conferences um, that really wear on the resources and and the staffing. And so hoping that more of these collaborations can take place and we can retain our statewide networks and connectivity, but really grow that um, with the with the regional programming as well. Um, so I'm I'm super excited to be able to um, yeah, spend spend the time thinking about what we can do together and what's next. Um, so yeah. Um, I can jump in here. Um, I, I think that something that I, I find just so valuable for us as such a small organization and the grant grazers have been around for a while, but um, we've always been a bit small and, um, and not, you know, not have had 
wide reaching goals per se. Um, we really care about our direct community and how we can affect change within our direct community. Um, but I think the opportunity for collaborating with other larger organizations to um, uh, just open us up to helping more individuals or connecting people with the right resources that are really going to make the difference for them um, is, is really amazing. Uh, I, I, I love the, the fact that we were able to put on this, uh, this group um, conference because it really, the, our small conferences that we've done in the past, um, you know, our, the community never changed really. It never expanded. We were seeing a lot of the same people, um, which is amazing that those are the people that we want to be supporting, but um, being able to expand and let uh, a larger area know about us as an organization and what we can do um, was really amazing. And as well as just the fact of being able to learn from a lot of you other organizations, um, the fact that you are very established have really, I mean, listening to all these programs you have coming up this year was really inspiring uh, to me personally. Just um, it's amazing how many resources are available. Uh, and so learning from everyone, getting inspired by uh, the different types of programs that you guys are putting on and whether we can collaborate or just inspire us to try something new and um, push something new for uh, our organization is, is very exciting. So it definitely opens our horizons, I feel, and I'm, I'm just happy to be part of this collaborative um, network. Yeah, I um, I just want to uh, put some positive words into how it pushes me out of my comfort zone in terms of like working with other nonprofits um, down here in, in in like you know Massachusetts, but even Southern New England. Um, just to have as a Massachusetts farmer, or actually I'm in Rhode Island, connect with Maine, connect with New Hampshire, connect with Vermont. We have very similar issues, similar solutions can be had, at, and it's just. It's it's really inspiring to like see exactly what what everybody here has been saying, what's going on, what we can work on together, and like where we're going to go. And one example is, um, you know, just thinking that we have all these common common issues in terms of labor, for example, and thinking about programs that have already existed, programs that are current, and then programs and how we want to mash all that together to make something for the future. And just talking and bouncing off ideas. And there's some heavy hitters in this group. You know, we've got like UVM, we've got like other universities, we've got um, extension groups. And then there's like this one person crew down here at TLI. So, but all of us can can work together and, and give back to the community that we're working with um, by having this, this network of information. Um, and then us as this like glob up here in the Northeast are also communicating with, with groups in like the mid-Atlantic, like PASA. So again, we can we can work together with those commonalities, get all those baseline, all get all that delicious data that we're all interested in, and kind of like put it back out to our constituents, which is super exciting. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I could add too much more onto that. I, I, it's kind of the benefit, I guess, of kind of you know being one of the last to speak. But I, I would just say, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear that you know, seeing in this in this particular. Um, panel here as, as well as in the greater conference that all of the organizations that participate here have, bring their own unique perspective and their their own skill set and and we are so much stronger together than we would be individually and so I I, I think that this uh, conference now being a, a, a regionally organized conference um, shows pretty clearly and, and pretty wonderfully um, you know, what, what the benefit is to acting regionally. I feel that this conference is, is uh, it, it feels as if it has a, a more, uh, you know, sustained kind of wider reach now. Um, and, and so I think that uh, we are also really lucky to have someone like Alex now as a, as a champion for a lot of this work and, and have that kind of sustained push forward uh, for the organization. That to me is, is one of the most useful things for, for the group and for that regional perspective is to have that champion that's going to uh, make sure that we're, we're all staying on track and, and pushing things forward and creating the agendas and being the glue that binds us all together. So 
shout out to Alex as well. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I wanted to ask a follow-up question to Sarah and turn it back to the group. You mentioned delicious data. And um, I was just wondering what this group thinks are the questions that you'd want to be asking all the farmers in your state and regionally. And what do you think we could be working on as a network to, to, to address those baseline questions we, we want to answer? Yeah, I think, you know, in our past, we as a group have had, um, you know, one or one or two surveys that we all kind of jumped on to, but I think, um, I think that's some future work for us to, to kind of hash out what those exact questions are. But I, I know that each individually we do it for our groups and I was just creating one the other day and I'm, I'm looking for some real basic stuff because um, one of the things I've always brought up to our group is like, we don't have like a cattlemen's association or like any of these kind of like bigger associations of sorts. So getting that data falls upon kind of these nonprofit folks to, to get it right first and get it to each other. So great question. Um, <laughs> but I know we're all still in our old middle wild west and, and, and collecting what we find relevant. Um, on the flip side of that, uh, also the other end of the life cycle, because I always have to talk about slaughter, is, is like, what do you want to get out of that? Um, so keep that in mind too, producers, like I'm looking at you, um, because we give you obviously a yield sheet and, and we're telling you what you're getting back, but maybe there's more that you want to know about and maybe we can work together on that as well. Thanks. As interesting um sarah about you know you have such an interesting role because you see the the end product or you know like or the the results of of what's been on pasture and the rest of us don't have that same kind of capacity and so that again like this the strength of pulling this network together because you know um I think this makes sense to everybody, but so often we're sort of pushed to be to collecting data to verify the work that we do so that we can get more money in. And we're not that's not the same data that our farmers might need to like measure whether where they are um, related to their peers and like the the benchmarking data we've we've talked about. Um, and that's a that would be a whole nother level um, that that is challenging to get and we we're all talking about how do we um what information do we ask for our farmers that will be most useful to them to look at in an aggregated form across the region and so if you have any ideas um then i'm looking at you producers out there uh we're we're and and how are we going to get that information how is it going to be reliable good solid data these are not things people do on a shoestring but can we with with the um, relationships we have with the close relationships all these organizations have with their members and their farmers you know can we come together and actually have something that that is a picture of new england that we can each bring our memberships to and and what's the data that we need to collect that would be most useful for our members um so those are i think those are some of the questions that we're working on in the in the network and we'd love to hear from our producers about that i think this could be a community question that we put out yeah. there on whova for post this session so think about it everyone um, so I just started in this role like six months ago or so, and even though I'm from this area, um, across New York State in general, like when I'm trying to work with farmers for grant opportunities or just work for my, you know, to look at grants for myself, um, I know USDA does the the census surveys and everything, and and me personally as a farmer, I hate doing surveys. I hate having to do more paperwork when I get home, and I hate all that. But I understand from my job perspective how important it is because uh, it's really hard to find good data, at least in New York State, um, or maybe I just haven't tapped into the right places yet. But who who are the grazing farmers? Um, what size or scale are you at? Because, you know, we do have people who have, you know, maybe five acres and a flock or what, there's, there's just such variety, but we don't, I don't have 
I don't know of an access point for me to get that data other than the USDA. And that's reliant on the people who actually fill it out and what checkbox they're they're checking that makes the most sense to them because you have to go within those parameters. So uh, for me, and I and I have no idea if anybody has an actual answer for this, but for across New York State, especially just so we have some sort of data um, to be like, hey, people who actually make the decisions up at the higher ups, look at how many people we have that are grazing and look at how much size and scale we have and look at how important it is to continue this research or, or these this type of work. So I guess that's my own my own two cents there. Okay, we have a few questions um, coming in. So I'll just open this up for questions. Um, Wait, so, hold on. I think oh. that I just opened up a poll. I think I just oh. did this. And oh. I think that like there are two polls out there that um, participants can answer. One was just this, like what farmer focused data do you want to, it's a short answer. So you have to put your answers in. And then the other one is um, at what time of year would you like a, a regional in-person grazing conference? So those two polls, technology is amazing. Okay, go ahead. Answer them everyone. Okay, so. Uh, our first question, if anyone on the is, does anyone on the panel have experience with Alan Savory or holistic management or done any training with the Savory Institute? I have not, although there are like um, Andrew was saying, you know, there are some amazing professionals and luminaries who we try to get out on pastures who have done that holistic training. Um, and I think that's um, is certainly inspiring work and we get to see him or, you know, folks that work for him when we go to um, national conferences, which is another, I think, collaborative push that I'd like to see us working towards in the future is um, even creating cohorts that go to these conferences together um, because it's uh it's really valuable and there are amazing ideas that are out there that it helps us get out of our our new england norm and and go to some of these national conferences and it's i think stronger to do as a cohort and of you know farmers and farmer focused organizations to do it together okay um next question is um, how do you panelists um, encourage farmers to participate in your programs? What methods do you use to increase uh, participation across your networks? I like to use food. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody likes to it likes a free meal um, or at least a cheaper meal. No, um, I so I worked for extension in a different county um, down in Orange County. Uh, so I guess I'll just go off of that experience, but it's really making connections, at least for me, it's making the connections with the farmer, building a rapport. And then also, you know, um, I would have an advisory panel as well to help guide me for what type of programming that they're also looking for. Um, and then trying to get the people to come. It's, you know, for me, it's best to try and get you know, the farmers that are interested in it to then talk to other farmers and network that way. Um, I mean, obviously we put out the flyers and everything and try to encourage them and, and use all the, you know, the good buzzwords. Um, and there's some, some ones that I can talk up more, you know, why they should come and everything, but really peer to peer seem, you know, that's for me, that has seemed to work so much better um, than, than for me, the extension person, why you should come to this. So um, that's, that's my two cents. Um, I will give a very boring answer and it's um, really about the schedule um, and the timing of it. I mean, granted, we, we do a lot of um, outreach and things like that to, you know, entice people to come to our programs. Uh, but we, this year, with our pasture walks, we kept them on the same day at the same time. It just changed location. Um, and we, you know, had sort of asked our constituents what kind of 
time of day and time of the week works best for people uh, because it's it's grazing season. It's everyone's busy season. So um, listening to your community and sort of um, making it work for them um, is a great way to just get as many people there as possible. Um, you know, you might get a lot of interest, but if the time is not going to work, you're not going to get people to show up. So I know that's very boring of an answer, but um, it really has has helped us. Um, and I think that sort of consistency um, and expectation is uh, something that, that works well for farmers. We're, we're people who plan, so it works out. Great, thanks. I really want, we have a couple minutes left and I wanna get this question in because I don't think we've we've yet focused on it. Um, how can we um, as a network in a region be collaborating on educating consumers? So I would say slaughterhouse tours, but that's just an easy answer. No, but like I, this is like the number one question. I'm also on a board of, um, you know, a buy local for vegetables. So it's the same question in every every sphere of local food. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I always hope that um, uh, conferences like this reach a broader audience as well, like not just farmers, not just TA providers, but also consumers who are just a little bit more interested, you know, maybe the homesteaders and, and, and then some. So project it at schools, project it at town halls. I don't know. Like it's got to be a little bit of a gorilla. It's got to be a little bit strategic and a little bit grant funded, I'd say. Yeah, totally. Um, and I, you know, I think also about um, how do I reach those people? How do I get them into a room to listen to somebody like Nicolette Nyman or, you know, like I, I want to bring her here, but it's our farmers aren't the audience that we want to hear her. We want the, the, the general public to hear her. So what are the partnerships beyond the New England Grazing Network that we need to start building that that reaches to um to a consumer audience that might be kind of like-minded, but might not have like really dug into the importance of supporting grass-based livestock in New England. Um, and then also, I mean, we do we are gonna do some programming in 2023, which is the year we're in right now, um, related to opportunities uh, to getting product and reaching the, um, the urban audience um what are and 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 just doing some wisdom sharing with folks that are that are successful at doing it talking about you know what you know the pandemic has changed things about reach and about uh consumers interest and understanding and so we will be doing some programming uh which should be really sh wisdom sharing again uh conversations between farmers about um what are some innovations that are happening relating to getting product to the urban audience yeah, and I just want to quickly jump in, you know, I work at Wolf's Neck Center and we are a community um, and public focused organization. So being part of this network has been really awesome for us as a as an organization that does school groups, does farm camp, has campground visitors, and we also have an organic dairy to be connecting in with these resources so that our educators can also learn more about grazing focused work in this region. And so I think it's, it really is all about collaboration and doing the programs we do best, but then cross cross pollinating, cross sharing um, in our areas of expertise. Um, so we are over time, out of time. I wanted to just quickly say that we shared a ton of resources in this session, um, probably too many resources. So um, I want, I'm going to just plug that we'll share out some of these things on the community board. We'll share out these upcoming events. We also have a, a newsletter that we send out monthly in the summer and um, quarterly in the winter for this network. You can send your events and programs to me. Um, and I try to share out all of this stuff in one place. Um, we also would love for you to answer those polls. So thank you so much. Thank you, panelists. This has been really great. Um, uh, the next session this is actually the end of day one. So the next session is going to be tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We'll kick off the day with a coffee shop chat with the grass whisperer and the Canadian pasture prophet. 
uh, aka Troy Bishop and Brian Maloney. Um, so come prepare to ask questions and um, yeah, just rest up and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.